Alrighty. So thank you everybody for coming to this uh, this week's Lunch and Learn, the Minds SEG Student Chapter Lunch and Learn. This is our first of the spring semester, and we will continue to bring you quality speakers from around the world. So this week, David Abbott, our speaker this week, is actually from Denver. Um, so let me just introduce David real quick, and then I'll give him the floor. So David is a consulting mining geologist, and he specializes in uh, the due diligence review of mineral reserve and resource estimates and in the review of disclosures about natural resources and the review of mineral exploration and development programs for both uh, precious and base metals. He's been writing about geoscience professional ethics and practices since 1989 and has published 173 professional ethics and practices columns in AIPG's The Professional Geologist magazine. So pretty good reference there for you, 173 columns is a, is a good amount, I think. And um, he was the AAPG, the Petroleum Geologist Distinguished Lecturer uh, for Ethics from July 2018 to 20, uh, June 2019. And before uh, his current role as a consultant, uh, David was actually a geologist for the US Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, uh, for over 20 years where he investigated and helped prosecute mining and oil and gas frauds. Uh, so Quite an interesting career you have, David. So uh, thank you for being here. And before I let you take the floor, I'm just going to remind everybody to turn your video off and mute yourself. Um, so that way, just like that, so we don't interrupt David. So uh, there you go. OK, well, um, if you're all seeing the uh, title screen, why, great. And um, the topics quickly are going to be talking about the founding of geoscience organizations and their ethics codes, which actually um, weren't the same. Uh, looking at some of the topics that are covered in those codes. Um, and then the newer geoethics uh, program that's come out of Europe, uh, changing things. Talk about society's needs for minerals and how that fits in with geoethics and gets into sustainable development and mining depletion because sustainable and depletion are mutually exclusive. And then finally, replacing the old depleted mines with new ones through substitutions, new technology, whatever, and reusing old mines after you're done with them. So, founding of geoscience organizations that were generally intended to provide the assurance that members were competent and honest, generally had educations and perhaps experience requirements. And here we have a short list of some of the prominent ones, Geological Society of London, the oldest uh, English speaking one in 1807, the American Institute of Mining Engineers, um, in 1871, and my great grandfather and his brothers were actually members um, back in 1875. The Society for Mining, Metallurgy, and Exploration, the Society of Petroleum Engineers, are now descendants of what started as AIE. Geological Society of America started in 88, AAPG in 1907. Society of Economic Geologists in 1920. But here we look at the year that they got into the ethics business. AAPG started in 1924. AIPG was founded in 63 and uh, used what was essentially the AAPG code at the time. The difference between the two was the operative verb was shall in one case and will in the other, I forget which is which. Um, and uh, then, oh, um, GSA finally got an ethics code in 2019 and the Society of Economic Geologists decided not to have an ethics code in 55 and 99. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, well, what am I, what am I not, okay. The organization of the AAPG code, um, uh, I think I got, it. yeah, okay. Um, as I say, APG was first in 24, they started talking about it in 1920. 
um, when they started realizing that the unqualified and unscrupulous were giving them a problem. Uh, in 1922, they said, well, we'll give the executive committee uh, the ability to um, expel anybody uh, if we have established principles. And then finally, in 1924, they adopted a code of ethics, and so they established what some of those principles were. And uh, so the organization of the thing they had uh, was in the Constitution, uh, article of general principles, another article on the relation of the geologist to the public and the profession, relation of the geologist to uh, the employer, relation of one geologist to another, duty to the association. And each of these articles had a varying number of sections underneath them that talked about more about what um, these various uh, articles related to. The SEG um, proceeded to uh, not have uh, a code of ethics. Um, in 1954, which was after the first uranium boom got going, and they were looking at the com what they viewed as the complexity of professional ethics uh, around the world. They said, well, gee, we have a, something in our bylaws that allows people to throw somebody out, and as much as that exists, why we won't do anything. And, and that they didn't think they'd have a lot of cases, which also tends to be true. But I think a little bit they were looking for a way out. In 1999, uh, which followed the uh, SEG had set up a committee following the 1997 conference on ethics in the geosciences. It was a GSA presidential uh, meeting. Uh, this was right after the BREX and several other mining scandals and the introduction of the new Canadian requirements of NI 43101 with the uh, qualified person standard. And so SEG said, hmm, we need to think about this more. And they said, well, half of their members live outside the US in 70 different countries. Most of them, you know, only 10 to 15% lived outside North America, but there certainly were diverse affiliations in customs and practices. Uh, and then they know that the adverse ethical finding could result in the loss of professional licensing or certification, and that the professional society is having such a program might expect significant legal challenges by the respondents. It certainly is one method of defending uh, an ethics charge is to claim that the people making the charge have somehow violated your legal rights. And that is a potential problem that's really the best justification that um, SEG had at the time for not getting into the ethics business. Plus, um, there's no real need for every organization to have a code of ethics. And I must say, I was part of the um, that 1999 ad hoc committee. And I know at the bottom there, uh, because SEG is a member of the American Geosciences Institute, why the members are expected to follow the AGI guidelines for ethical professional conduct, the most recent versions of which was published in um, 2019. And that's available on the AGI website. So let's look at some common features of geoscience ethics codes. Uh, and, you know, not surprising thing, honesty is one of the real B's, professional confident, competence. Uh, adherence to scientific methods, resolving conflicts, recognizing and resolving conflicts of uh, conflicts of interest, uh, which really is perhaps the most common sort of ethical issue that comes up for most of us. Respecting one's calling, and then lifelong learning or continuing professional development. Less common, uh, particularly the publishing issues and the American Geophysical Union 
the um, Geological Society of London and GS GSA are very into the publishing business. They have uh, published what some of their publishing um, ethical issues are, and uh, it's appropriate for them to have them, but not necessarily everybody else. What AIPG has done when we've had the occasional publishing question come up, we've referred to um, the AGU's um, provisions as uh, providing guidance. And then there are emerging issues. Um, the harassment, discrimination, certainly coming out of the Me Too movement and other things. Uh, recently, uh, lots of places. Um, dealing with live research subjects. You know, rocks are inanimate and unfeeling, but we're increasingly getting involved with projects that involve people and are. Uh, fellows in the biological sciences, medicine, and social sciences, their ethics codes have a lot of stuff on dealing with live people. And this is something I think that at least in certain instances, the geosciences are going to start having to pay more attention to. Uh, sustainable development will be discussing in a little more detail. And then global human welfare and the sustainable development is really part of that. And that's where the um, uh, geoethics people come in. So the geoethics was born in 2012 in Europe and um, promoted in Brisbane uh, with the International Association for Moshi promoting geoethics. Um, and the definition is that geoethics consists of research and reflection on the values which underpin appropriate behaviors and practices wherever human activities interact with the Earth system. Geoethics deals with the ethical, social, and cultural implications of geoscience education, research and practice, and with a social role and responsibility of geoscientists in conducting their activities. So a broader thing than just looking strictly at geoscience practice and traditionally done. And the IAPG is supported by over 20 associated geoscience organizations, including the Association of um, Engineering and Environmental Geologists, AGI, AGU, European Federation of Geologists, and so on. Conspicuously absent are the big mining uh, and petroleum societies, AAPG, Australasian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum, uh, Institute of Mining, Metallurgy in Britain, SEG, SME, the South African Institute of Mining and Metallurgy. It's not that the mining industry is uninterested in um, dealing with things like social licensing, but uh, somehow uh, these other folks haven't felt that we belong in the club, and that's very unfortunate. Let's look at their basic fundamental values. Uh, first, honesty, integrity, transparency. Uh, certainly standard competence, including lifelong learning. Sharing knowledge at all levels is important. Uh, you communicate the results um, and recognizing the limitations about the probabilities and uncertainties because there are a lot of things we don't know. Um, verifying the sources of our information and data and being objective, uh, unbiased peer review, uh, always debates about that. Working in the spirit of cooperation and reciprocity and uh, respecting natural processes and phenomena and planning inter implementing interventions in the environment that make sense. These are all pretty much standard uh, principles bias. Here are the, the, the new ones, I will say, that uh, where geoethics is expanding. 
Protecting geodiversity is an essential aspect of the development of biodiversity, cultural and social diversity. Enhancing geo heritage, the various scientific and cultural factors that uh, have intrinsic social and economic values, um, strengthen the sense of people belonging to their environment. Nine, which we're going to be discussing in more detail, ensuring a sustainable supply of uh, minerals for future generations. Well, not minerals, but uh, natural resources. And um, there's some problems with that. Finally, promoting education and outreach for all, um, again, geohazard prevention and mitigation, um, environmental protection and increased societal resilience and well-being. These are where we're getting into a broader uh, category of ethical considerations. And uh, exploring the concept a little more um, is they're looking to shape a deeper uh, engagement, uh, wider relevance, um, looking at a virtue um, and uh, how we fit into society as a whole. And quite frankly, the, um, the geosciences are perhaps ahead of many other uh, science groups and others by expanding the uh, ethical concepts in the way that uh, geoethics has. Um, they talk about some interesting things. One of the things is they talk about ethical but upsetting geoscience research. And here in the front range, we have the problem of what's been the oil patch um, up and down the front range from Denver north to Pretty much the Wyoming line had been uh, oil and gas fairway for years, but all of a sudden everybody was wanting to build homes in there and saying, oh, we don't want to be anywhere near the oil and gas. Well, it was there and you're moving into it. Um, certainly a lot of political problems going on with uh, whether or not we can continue developing um, Denver Basin hydrocarbons. The location of nuclear waste depositories and the consequences of not having them. Here in the U.S., of course, we looked at Yucca Mountain and uh, it was eventually decided that that could not go forward because of the unrealistic uh, principles where you have to guarantee that nothing can ever leak for tens of thousands of years, which, of course, is an impossible uh, provision to guarantee that you can do that. Um, so instead, we have temporary, as it were, nuclear waste uh, facilities being in places like no, around all the metro New York hospitals or the uh, power plants. Is that really um, better than having these um, depositories at Yucca Mountain? Um, Interesting uh, article this year, um, this disaster by choice, which says we natural hazards occur, but depending on how we uh, address them and prepare for them, we can turn hazards into disasters um, through our political will or lack thereof. Housing construction and areas of active rockfall being an example. We'll see some of those presently. Uh, ah, here we are. Glenwood Springs in 2004. There was this fellow that had a you know, lovely recliner watching his TV. The rock rolled down the um, hillside and into his home. And uh, not so good. Uh, there's a the map of Glenwood Springs there on the left, and it's a narrow, uh, narrow valley along the Roaring Fork River, um, and it's particularly the housing on the west side of the Roaring Fork and those uh, very steep hillsides uh, to the left of them, and that's where this uh, rock came down off of, and uh, but 
them? Can we convince town councils, county commissions, and so forth to zone things such that rockfall prevents one from developing things, and that's often not a particularly politically popular thing to do. Um, so again, this problem of um, the hazards exist, do we uh, deal with them or make them catastrophes? Um, and then there was the L'Aquila earthquake in April of 2009, killed 29 people, lots of others injured, uh, pretty much destroyed the town and resulted in six seismologists and a seismic engineer being criminally charged for failing to tell people that it's going to happen quite quickly. They um, did not uh, warn the public of the imminence and severity of the earthquake that was going to happen. A uh, problem, obviously. Um, and the Italian legal system did what it did eventually. And they sentenced these folks to six years in jail, perpetual interdiction from public office, and a fine of several million euros. The old uh, approach to justice, which says, I'm injured, you owe me. Um, there's, uh, that can be a little bit overdone. Eventually, in November 14, the convictions were overturned and the uh, seismic engineer uh, jail sentence was reduced essentially to time served. But this does show us some limits to what we ought to be doing as geoscientists. Namely, we should effectively communicate the probabilities of a geohazard. Um, uh, and, uh, but we should not be the bookmakers. We're not the, poly, you know, excuse me, we are the bookmakers and say, so, you know, what the odds are, but we should not tell people, yes, uh, you should get out of Dodge now or no, it'll be okay for a couple of weeks or whatever. We should not be placing the bets. That's what really got these folks in trouble in Italy. Then there's the geodiversity, and part of this is, is um, desecration of outcrops. And here we have this lovely hunk of uh, layered basalt, I guess, that's had the thing drilled the heck out of. I will not pretend that I can properly pronounce it in appropriate Scots um, the quote there, but you can all see it and completely understand what the heck's gone on. Um, outcrop desecration is a problem. Uh, the Geologist Association has this geologic fieldwork code. You can get it off the web. It's very good. And students should be encouraged to observe and record and not hammer indiscriminately. Certainly when I was, a, most of us were students, the whole thing is you hopped out of the bus or the cars or whatever when you got up to an outcrop. And, pulled out your hammer and banged like mad to show the professor how enthusiastic you were. Student hammers should be banned from most field trips. Uh, we really, you know, there's usually enough float at the bottom, broken rock at the bottom that you can get, get the sample of what you want. And uh, the in situ fossils, uh, structures or whatever, um, the reason we go to the outcrop should be preserved so that you can continue to do so. And then there's the uh, folks that want to uh, paint uh, numbers or X's or something on the outcrop to say, here's the important point, makes it look like hell. Uh, hey, that's the great thing about digital cameras anymore. You can take the picture and pretty quick annotate it um, to show where you took the samples or where the, you know, the, very, uh, the notations you need to make it um, would have been annotated, uh, but you don't have to bring out your spray cream. Um, no geoscience graffiti. The 
AIPG came out with a white paper on responsible mining uh, three years ago. And did note that societies are dependent on minerals um, and that there was a strong correlation between economic growth uh, and mineral and metal consumption and that geology tells us where the minerals are um, so that mining is geographically constrained even though the use of products is, is worldwide. Um, some popular products and you know, we used to think of the diamonds pretty much came from Russia and South Africa until we started finding some of those deposits in Canada and Australia. Um, but in any case, mining doesn't choose the locations that are logistically, socially, environmentally, or politically optimal, appropriate, or friendly. That doesn't how things work. And so we have to think about, should we be getting our rare earth elements? Not that they're that rare. But um, for all our modern electronics and everything else, should we get them from China or should we get them from the mountain pass deposit in California? And of course, California doesn't like mining. Likewise, should we get the copper from Arizona and Utah where we have better environmental laws than Peru, Chile, or Mexico? Um, you know, the uh, debates that we can have. And we all need minerals. This is the 2020 uh, numbers for the mineral baby. This is something that's uh, put out by the Minerals Education Coalition at uh, SME. And uh, as the numbers change every year, and it's interesting to look at those, but that's a different lecture. Uh, the point being that uh, in a lifetime, we're going to use an awful lot of minerals that most people don't recognize this. And uh, you can get this, uh, this uh, drawing, put it on a uh, business card and hand it out to people. It's a real eye opener. And it's updated every summer. Um, as I say, anyway. Uh, and then we think about, OK, we switch things. Oh, we're going to switch from oil and gas to wind power. Well, that takes a lot of metals and minerals to develop just one turbine. Uh, a lot of steel, copper, a lot of concrete for the base, aluminum for the uh, power and, and the blades, a uh, bunch of rare, particularly neodymium for the magnets in the uh, generator, uh, lithium, zinc, and so forth. Um, again, this is where I get into some substitutions, one mineral resource for another. We really want to look at this ninth fundamental value, which says that ensuring sustainability of economic and social activities in order to assure the future generation of supply of energy and other natural resources. Unfortunately, this statement fails to transparently, forth, you know, forthrightly, um, I honestly acknowledge that natural resource deposits are depletable, thus inhibiting a fully integral and transparent discussion of what the value statement is trying to get at, which is where are future generations going to get their minerals? Depletability is a fact of nature. And the failure to recognize that uh, is, a, I think, a real shortcoming in this value. Um, and uh, thus the major failing of the uh, white paper. They really don't talk about that. Uh, and part of it is, you know, what does sustainable development really mean? And really the most widely quoted definition it was from the Brundtland Commission of the UN in 1987, which is sustainable development is the one that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Thus, there are no limits on the life of a sustainable development as commonly used and understood. Problem is that individual natural resource deposits and 
uh, limited in size and depletable, and their extraction is time limited. Uh, or as Wesson pointed out uh, a couple, three years ago, the production of mineral resources and fossil fuels would seem to be activities that cannot, by definition, be sustainable. But the extractive industries are providing necessary materials for society. Um, you have to recognize what the truth is before you can deal with the problem. And the pleadability is that, and in addition, just to the fact that the, the deposits themselves are limited in size, there are various factors of geology, deposit delineation, extraction and processing techniques and costs prevent 100% extraction of the valuable constituents of any deposit. Uh, and this is true whether we're talking about um, where the, the uh, valuable resource is 100% of the core of the deposit, such as a paper grade marble or dimension stone, uh, or a few parts per million, uh, the grams per ton, in the case of gold and platinum group element metal deposits. Um, you don't get 100%. Uh, you know, even if you've got, you know, big hunk of uh, granite baffle that you're getting stone out of uh, joints and uh, simply the uh, wastage of cutting and so forth, you don't get 100% of the volume of the granite in terms of saleable countertops, headstones, whatever you're making out of it. And of course, that extraction, whichever it is, is going to have various negative environmental and social impacts and have to be balanced with maximizing resource recovery. If we're going to mine them, let's get as much as we can, but where is the balance? And so here we have, do we maximize recovery of the valuable constituents uh, or minimize the social and environmental impacts from the deposit a balance needs to be achieved and how you go about that is a problem. You can have the uh, various attempts that people really do work on of trying to get all the stakeholders to agree on how something should go forward or do you have somebody that serves as the grand poobah, the lowered high, everything else from the Mikado? Uh, somebody decides. Uh, Professor Sirkabi from Utah put out this uh, really nice um, diagram about social licensing to operate. Uh, at the bottom of which is the rejection and the withdrawal of being able to mine at all. And, um, you have lawsuits, boycotts, blockages, and I you simply can't below some level. Then there's a, an area of acceptance and tolerance, um, you know, you allowing it to happen while holding your nose sort of thing. Uh, hopefully we get more towards an approval or support or even co-ownership, um, in which case you have a much higher uh, social license to operate when there's mutual trust and credibility involved. The SME put out this sustainable development statement in April 2016. Um, the, I'm, those of you who have been the members of SME since prior to 2016, most of you probably don't remember seeing this, and if you're a more recent member, you probably haven't either. Um, it's a good statement, you know, recognizes that the problem is that mining and mineral industry is generally regarded as polluting and environmentally hostile. The impression based on mining practices um, particularly during the 19th century, where smaller operations, um, little understanding of future impacts, uh, and that's changed with the expansions of population, ease of travel, more appreciation of what the environmental impacts are, 
um, and mining in undeveloped countries uh, or areas of the indigenous populations again generated issues about the equitable distribution of profits. The contemporary mining industry is abundantly cognizant of these and is aggressively engaged in conducting operations in a safe and sustainable manner. Um, but we really need to, you know, people want the minerals and they've got to stop looking at the mining, uh, the extractive industries as the bad guys and work towards a common balance of what we're going to allow to provide for what society needs. Um, and that's a problem. So we have a best practices for responsible mining, which, you know, things like in identifying and engaging all relevant stakeholders, both local and regionally, nationally, um, the NGOs, um, conducting open, inclusive, and continuing dialogue, and all people need to be in this business of being open um, and uh, willing to listen to what the other side is talking about, um, looking for areas where there's reasonable alignment of values that can then uh, help uh, things along. Certainly want to minimize the environmental impacts um, manage waste in efficient and safe ways, uh, plans for closures and rehabilitation, again, to uh, eliminate long-term impacts, uh, improve health and safety. Those are, those are things that the people in the extractive industries are quite in favor of. Uh, but again, this balance is an issue. Um, and I say, I think this, the geoethics statement that is currently provided is needs to be changed. So my suggestion is with assuring supplies of resources for future generations requires recognition that individual natural resource deposits are depletable and their identification, delineation, extraction, and processing have social and environmental consequences whose mitigation must be balanced with maximizing the recovery of the valuable minerals needed by society from each deposit. Um, and I agree, you know, by using the word natural resources, that includes uh, the various fuels, um, and we don't need to include energy. Getting Green Done, uh, a very interesting book by Auden Schindler. Uh, who is the um, vice president for um, environment and sustainability for Aspen Ski Corp. Um, and he says the great flaw in the sustainable business is that few people are willing to admit that achieving sustainability is difficult, can be impossible, uh, particularly without big changes in the way the current world operates. And the book is tested by the fact that the sustainable business movement doesn't glide along the rails. It's messy, it's dirty, um, it has various starts and stops. Um, so again, I commend uh, the book to you. And finding new replies is to replace the depleted ones. Well, there are problems with that. And, and uh, as Grennan and Clifford point out, two of the principal exploration tend to be ignored. First is the high risk. Uh, they're noting at the time the exploration success in Ireland, where they're from, is 5,000 to one. Uh, and most people simply, especially those in government or even in academia, can't understand why anyone would undertake such risk. And why there are special sections within the stock exchanges for such high risk companies as, as uh, mining exploration groups. And secondly, having succeeded in finding a valuable deposit, the extent of regulatory obstacles put in the way of development is enormous and costly, um, but the environmental lobby has effectively captured the administrative system. There is not uh, perhaps the balance that there ought to be. 
it also is getting more expensive to find uh, new deposits. And uh, interesting graph from a um, couple of years ago uh, from the uh, SEG newsletter. And from the same newsletter, the deposit depths. And this is kind of interesting. The, um, the red dots for South Africa and gold are obviously an outlier from um, the other gold deposits and base metal deposits. It's not surprising that gold can go deeper. Um, and again, it's a function of the grade of the deposit and so forth um, as to how deep you can go, grade and size. And here we have more recently uh, from Two years ago now, the, or a little over a year, I should say, because it was in the December newsletter. The depths to moderate and giant size base metal deposits, um, either greenfield or brownfield deposits. What's interesting is you see over there on the right side, there's um, five big, uh, five or six big uh, greenfield deposits that are real deep, all have stars beside them. And they were found by oil exploration, the people who were drilling deeper and suddenly start seeing sulfides or whatever in the uh, sediments that they're going through. Um, we're looking at, at uh, you know, the Mississippi Valley kind of deposits. And the way we search for deposits certainly has changed over the years. Um, we see here, uh, the prospector, the blue bars in the first half of the 20th century uh, were quite prominent uh, in the first decade of the 20th century and continually uh, decreasing to the point of essentially non-existent. Um, obviously, extrapolation from no more is uh, a continual way of doing things, um, you know, hunting and being you know, to hunt elephants go to elephant country. Uh, mapping has has been and uh, I think continues to be uh, important. But geochemistry and geophysics are the the uh, things that have come in since World War II that uh, make a big difference in finding um, deposits. And alternatives and substitutes, um, you know, lead oxide um, used to be the primary white pigment and paint and everything. And, uh, apparently it was sweet. I, I mean, never chewed on it, but the talk about kids chewing on uh, uh, window sills and so forth that I had a sister who did it. Um, then we uh, got rid of lead and paint. So now we use titanium oxide uh, as our white pigment, and you look at all kinds of things why I have uh, titanium oxide in the ingredients. We get it from ilmenite, um, and then the relative percentages of platinum and palladium uh, in catalytic converters changes from year to year. Because um, the automakers want to use the, uh, the cheaper of the two metals, and so here we have the the prices since January of 94 up until uh, January of this year of uh, palladium and platinum. And for um, the 21st century, why platinum has been usually the uh, dramatically uh, higher cost metal, all of a sudden in the last three or four years, the um, price of palladium has gone through the roof. And platinum, while it's still expensive, um, is a lot cheaper um, at the price. Uh, and so this makes a difference in what the uh, mix of platinum and palladium, the catalytic converters are every year. And it changes from manufacturer to manufacturer and year to year uh, as to what those ratios are. Um, And then improved technology is going to make a difference in terms of what mining costs are going to be. 
And here we have, um, these are the titles of articles of mining and engineering for the past couple of years. Uh, battery electric vehicles, uh, zero CO2, innovation, automation, monitoring with road hull with drones, new technologies or tailings dams, water management systems, going to all electric vehicles, um, reusing mine lands, Dr. Alamore. Uh, Komatsu coming up with a driverless fleet. Um, these all are going to be making differences. And, and uh, as we go underground, why the amount of time it takes for personnel to go from the surface to the working faces uh, increases as the mines get deeper um, laterally or further away vertically. There's just that travel time in there. Uh, where to the extent that you have um, a mining fleet that can be operated from the surface remotely, uh, it can make a big difference in what uh, the cost might be. And then what do we do with the mines after? Uh, post mining use. And there's a picture of a lovely little uh, recreational area, you know, park, got some tennis courts, it's got a nice beach, a little a nice pond for canoeing and sailing. And this is down in Georgia. This is an old tailwind pit. Uh, now we have a very nice place. A um, couple of pictures from the Denver area. Uh, you know, we, nobody wants to live near an active sanding gravel quarry. You know, they're dusty and noisy and so on. But once they're through and they can become ponds, all of a sudden, right, nice backdrops to back to golf courses or to gated communities. Um, the picture on the left is um, between uh, just south of Highway 58 and west of I-70, east of Golden. Uh, on the right is um, the South Flat, just north of um, E-470 and the um, Chatfield Dam, and so here we have all these former gravel pits that now, oh, they're, they're nice little lakes, and that's wonderful. And these nice little lakes actually can be used for water storage and are being used for water storage. Uh, those of you who have been around uh, the Front Range for a while remember all the debates over the Two Forks Dam that was denied um, and we are now using all the gravel pits um, all on the South Platte as we see in the uh, right hand picture uh, was a, a formal gravel pits there in north of Commerce City in Derby and these are actually being used uh, as water storage and the water then being pumped back up uh, into the southeast metro area where uh, they depended on the Denver Arapaho water aquifer, which is going down, and they need a uh, accessibility to um, the repairing uh, water sources along the river. On the left is the Morrison aggregate quarry there, south of the town of Morrison. And uh, at the top, I noticed that uh, part of the pit has been filled in with the lake. Morrison is not gotten any bigger over the years because Morrison doesn't have any water storage facilities. And suddenly now this um, aggregate quarry uh, is beginning to provide a facility where uh, Morrison can store water and maybe um, the size of the town of Morrison can increase, whether you think that's a good or bad thing, is something else. Of course, the fun thing about this quarry is that they've um, landscaped the upper benches. And so, although you can see it quite clearly from Hampton, uh, even over in East Denver, um, most people don't know what they're looking at. Um, you know, they don't recognize that there's a pit around until they uh, coming down uh, Floyd Hill on I-70 and looking at the um, Fry Brothers Quarry. 
Um, this is Breckenridge. And Breckenridge um, really started out as a gold dredging uh, area. And along the uh, Blue River, which extends from the top to the bottom of the picture on the left side there, uh, all that tan area is actually the old dredge tailings. And down to the south in the town of Breckenridge, why they've all been reclaimed for parking lots and strip malls and uh, even the airport, I think, got put in there. Um, so the, the dredges went all the way up through town, uh, but the tailings have been reclaimed, uh, except at the north end there along the Blue River. Then along the, the uh, top of the right-hand side is the Swan River. Uh, again, the dredge tailings have been uh, refurbished uh, on the downstream, and then it's only where you get up on the uh, further east on the right, you see the, that uh, tan strip that are the unreclaimed dredge tailings. And then finally, down on the bottom is French Gulch. Again, dredges went up there, and it's on the east side where you see the, the tan uh, dredge tailings in there. And of course, the other thing one can ask about the Breckenridge district is there are a whole bunch of mines in here. And would it be possible to use some of them as pump storage for hydroelectric um, facilities? Um, uh, there is the potential there for we have the appropriate uh, vertical distance and uh, storage capacities? I don't know, but it's a question that perhaps could be asked in, in uh, some of our mountain mining towns because uh, pump storage can be a very effective means of uh, providing for uh, peak load uh, electric generation. And old mines can be used for other things. Um, mushroom mines. Um, those of you who drive over to Grand Junction knows that just east of Palisade there at the back is the, the Cameo power plant. And the Cameo coal mine uh, was on the south side of the river, uh, right off the freeway. Uh, it's closed now, and now it's a mushroom farm. You know, what do you need to grow mushrooms? Dark and damp, and coal mines are dark and damp. Um, and so various people are figuring out that, that uh, uh, some of these old mines can be uh, great uh, sources of agricultural use. And, and then they also can be, uh, here we have some of the limestone quarries um, in Kansas or Illinois, uh, immense underground quarries, uh, or caverns that make uh, lovely places for uh, storing stuff. Um, underground, it doesn't get rained on, and uh, again, the environment's very consistent. Uh, salt mine there in Hutchinson, Kansas, you know, you know, beloved of, of uh, the film industry for the preservation of uh, film negatives and uh, paper film. Salt mines um, have incredibly low humidity. So again, uh, what was a mine now can have alternative uses. And uh, the thing that's neat about the uh, butch Butcher Gardens in Victoria, British Columbia, uh, are the fact that, that um, they were able to convince people that the high walls and the benches were architecturally significant features and should not be blown down, uh, as we see particularly in, in photograph A over on the right side. So if you think about what's happening with your property as you're going through the mining and where are you going to put your waste and what are the, the other services, you think about future uses, um, you can adjust things so that you can uh, possibly uh, convert what was your mining property into a subsequent uh, beneficial use um, and worth some additional money to the uh, firm. 
And one of my favorite things is, is uh, the Thornton Quarry in Illinois. This is in the southeastern metropolitan Chicago, where Interstate 80 and 294 uh, are the same at the point. And they go for this, well, um, south side, almost two miles of 350 feet up in the air. There's this literal pillar of limestone, uh, just wide enough for the width of the freeways uh, between uh, these quarries um, that um, are used. And they, they now are converted the quarries, the north one and, and the west one, into um, flood uh, surge storage ponds. Um, you know, the, uh, the need that I got on the surge storage, uh, and oh, somebody already dug the hole for us. And uh, a cousin of mine who's a civil engineer in uh, Illinois says, the neat thing about the Thornton Quarry, it's the only limestone quarry in the area that doesn't have any flint in it. And so they uh, can use the cement from made from this uh, the lime in these quarries uh, doesn't have any of the um, silicon uh, reactions that uh, can cause uh, uh, the uh, degradation of concrete um, as life goes on. And uh, this, this uh, incredible, um, as I say, uh, strip that the highway goes on, uh, John McPhee described this as being the closest thing that most Midwesterners ever get to the Grand Canyon. Um, it's really a pretty incredible thing to, to be able to visit and go into, and I had, had the chance to do so. So I thank you very much, and um, we uh, hope that uh, things have gone well, and uh, if Oh, I want to uh, uh, stop the sharing and go back to uh, seeing what uh, individuals and have some chance to uh, talk with everybody. <laughs> yeah, thank you, David. Um, if there's any questions, by anybody, feel free to un unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. David, I'm this is Fred Perkle. Yeah, Fred. Um, in the Southeast, we, with our old mine, some of our old mines, we go into the areas where you may have slimes and you can't build on it or anything, or you have quarries and you have ponds and people say, we don't want to use those for water resources because of the evaporation rate. We have found putting solar panels over on floating them on the water allows you to generate electricity either for the mining company or to sell back into the grid. And this is becoming quite popular with some of the mining companies in the southeast. I don't well, know. That would make a heck that. of a lot of sense. Those those ponds I was showing the picture of on the South Platte are not very deep. There's a tremendous evapotranspir transpiration mm -hmm. problem with those. So that idea of putting the, the solar uh, farms on top of that is a great one. Thank you, Fred. Yeah, the company I'm with, that's what we do. So I'm familiar with some of them. So David, I have a question regarding the um the IAPG, the geoethics organization you recommended or that you yes. discussed. Why exactly do you think that organizations like AAPG or SEG haven't joined? Do you think it do you think it's the specific language, like specifically the the point that you wanted to amend, or do you think they just haven't, or do you just think they don't need to join at the moment? The the geoethics group, the IAPG, is centered in Europe. And Europe doesn't have the mining that it used to have. And right. so I think it's ignorance on the part of, of uh, a lot of people that, that don't really 
the, the genius scientists in Europe don't understand the mining business, the extractive business, because it's all done in Africa or Asia or you know North or South America. So I think it, part of it's ignorance. Um, you know, they're thinking, oh gee, we have all these you know things that they they do complain about, but it, to me, it's it's that they simply have failed to recognize that the mining industry really does care about its environmental impacts and, um, you know, the, the, as I say, simply failing to recognize that natural resource deposits are depletable. Right. Uh, and that you get when you work with a few deposits over a few years. Yeah. Uh, or sometimes they just get a lot bigger than that. But when I worked with the longest is still water and it just gets bigger and deeper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One more question uh, for you, David. This is Fred again. Is it possible yeah. to get a set of your slides? Um, send me an email. Okay. What is the best address? I've got yours somewhere, but I don't have it right with me. Yeah, it's D-M-A-G-E-O-L at MSN.com. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, I've got it on the they sent me resources or reserves committee or something. <laughs> Are there any other uh, questions for David? Well, if not, um, thank you again, David, for your talk. Um, did somebody just unmute themselves or is that? Yes, this is Leonard Carr. I have a, a question, if I may. Certainly. David, uh, I'm a geologist. I've been doing mineral exploration for nine, 40 years all over the world. And uh, I really enjoyed your talk. I think it's a, a great talk, very timely. Uh, but what I've seen in my career, which is a bit of a gorilla in the room, is the wild and woolly world of junior mining companies and their let's call it their casual relationship with the truth at times. And, yep. <laughs> and that is, um, that's something I've run across personally on many occasions. I know many of the people listening would have their own stories. Um, could you maybe expound on that and how uh, an average field geologist, maybe a young geologist who's working on an overseas project or even domestic and encounters some Something untoward. Um, yeah, the do about that. The problem with um, you know prospectors and, and promoters. If Dante was right about the sign on the gate to hell about giving up hope, uh, they'll never go to hell because they. Uh, and quite frankly these people and, and working, you know, dealing with, with fraud cases with the SEC, I saw a lot of this. And the best of the fraudsters, they believe their own bullshit. Uh, they could pass a lie detector test, no problem at all. Um, you know, uh, so sort of like Mr. Trump who can't believe that the votes are legitimate. Um, one of the other problems that I've seen is that those of us who are in the legitimate mining industry and are used to people telling the truth um, periodically get surprised when one of these people comes in and starts spinning a tail uh, because we just haven't seen it. Um, and uh, the other problem is that even if you think that there might be something fishy going on, how can you prove it? There were certainly people who were beginning to worry a lot about what Briex was claiming to have um, in late 96, but you know they were not in a position to uh, have any hard information to prove that it was indeed the, the fraud, the salting job that was going on. Um, and one of the, the, uh, the problems that, uh, you know, the, 
uh, those of us in, uh, are trying to, when we come across these people, is uh, being able to demonstrate to uh, the securities people and so forth whose job it is to prosecute such things that, yeah, this really is a uh, bad things are going on and, and uh, willing to let the people know and, and provide expertise to them. Um, and uh, a basis for saying, yeah, that, that uh, these claims are um, unfounded. It's, um, you know, uh, it's not easy, but it's been going on for a long, long time. Even right. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the recording here.